Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your trip to Tennessee. Thank you so much, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Today's episode is a very special live recording that we did during our recent Military History and Armed Forces Symposium. We got to spend a little time with Kevin Rumley, who I think you'll agree is a really interesting and fascinating guy who's doing some great work with military veterans. So I hope you enjoy this special recording. Welcome to this live recording of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. We're recording this episode at the 2022 Military History and Armed Forces Symposium, and my very special guest is Kevin Rumley. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Um, Kevin um, has made the journey from homeless veteran to graduating with a master's degree in social work, and he now helps other veterans realize their own dreams of recovery. So we're going to have a, a, a very interesting talk about that, Kevin. But first of all, I want to back all the way back. Uh, tell our listeners and our audience, uh, where did you come from? What was your childhood like? Yeah, so I grew up in Fairfax, Northern Virginia. Had two brothers and pretty amazing, uh, stable upbringing. I, my father was a Marine. Then he joined, uh, became a policeman. And, uh, you know, it was uneventful. I, I call it the, the Disney Channel childhood. And I really didn't have any trauma. I knew, I think, right from wrong. And my days were la- really lined out for me. Um, couldn't ask for anything more of a childhood until, unexpectedly, when I was 15, my mother passed away. She had a pulmonary embolism. And one day I went to school and was called to the principal's office. They said, your mom's in the hospital. And she had passed away within the hour. And that just shattered my entire reality, my sense of safety. Um, And a lot of my stability and sense of security was gone. And of course your dad was grieving. Uh, Yes. Your entire family struggled. Yes, exactly. So my father's grieving. Um, He had married the love of his life and we're grieving the loss of our mother. So at a young age, I turned to alcohol. So I was 15 years old and all of this pain, but I had alcohol. And alcohol made me feel okay. It numbed these feelings. And so early on, I learned a great coping skill. If you drink yourself to oblivion, you don't have to feel life's feelings. It's not, that's not very successful long term though, right? No. And uh, it proved a challenge repeatedly throughout my life. And this is the recurring struggle that I have dealt with, which is addiction. And the veterans that I work with now continue to struggle with is how do we live life on life's terms in a way where our best efforts at coping don't derail us. Um, So even at 15, I was barely making it through high school. I only made it because I had teachers that believed in me and they knew who I was before my mother passed. And uh, so luckily I made it out of high school, but uh, yeah, I, I... was already talking to the Marine Corps recruiter. Said, "I need well, a that's, plan." That's, I was curious. <laughs> I was curious. At what point did you? Were you entertaining entering the Marine Corps, or how did you encounter somebody who put that idea in your head? Well, my father was a Marine, so there was a lot of pride in the Marine Corps. Growing up in Northern Virginia, Arlington, and Fairfax, everyone worked for the Armed Forces and the Pentagon. Um, so I was in the culture, in the milieu. I think um, something I noticed in the Marine Corps, I was in the infantry, 
Obviously, you can tell by my long hair, and for those on the podcast, I have really long hair and a beard. I don't look like many Marines. But I, I knew that the Marine Corps were the best. That's just, at the end of the day, the Marines are the best. <laughs> I wanted to join the best. I'm sure there's some people out here who might disagree. I know. There may be a few Army people out there. You're the one with the microphone, and you're on the <laughs> stage, so you get to make that, that claim. That's right. But I... I Knew I wanted to do something. I also, college wasn't in my future. I barely made it through high school. I had very few options. And uh, the armed forces was really the only pathway um, that I saw. Because other than that, I was just skateboarding and um, really drinking every day. So I, I remember I had long bleach blonde hair. And I skateboarded down to the recruiter's office. And I told him... I want to be a Marine, and I want to be sent to war. And he said, we can do both of those things for you. (laughs) And they did. And so what what was your uh, training like? Not being in the military myself, I haven't gone through that. So, you know, I only know what I see on TV. And I know it seems like they're not very friendly to people with long, bleached blonde hair who've skateboarded in. Yeah, they're not especially friendly to long hair uh, hippies. So their first words were, how dare you disrespect my Marine Corps? And uh, for 13 weeks, that was my experience. They break you down and transform you into a new human being. I loved every minute of it, which is wild. But I realized that it's, everything is for a purpose. Everything that they do is for a reason. And um, the reason is to prepare you for... Um, really future combat. That is 100% the purpose. That wasn't clear prior to joining. It's not always made clear, but it is, uh, especially in the Marine Corps, you are trained to fight, and that's your purpose. And so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the time in the military before you were injured. How how was that going? That was... um, So I enlisted as a 0311, which is a rifleman. That's the infantry, tip of the spear. And I had aspirations. I wanted to do um, force recon and be special forces. I was in track and field. I did swimming in high school. So I had focused physically on all of those requisites. But um, everything else, I wasn't prepared for the pace. The pace of the Marine Corps is a lot of hurry up and wait. Um, I wanted to be, you know, you come in as a Lance Corporal, or I came out as a PFC. It just takes time, right? It takes years and years and years. And part of it was just the patience in the process and these life skills that I got to begin to uh, put into practice, the Marines really taught me. But then I got to go to a School of Infantry. That's where you are trained in your profession. And then I was sent to 29 Palms, California, where I joined uh, 3-7 Lima Company. And uh, where were you stationed when you were injured? So I'm with 3-7 Lima Company, 29 Palms, and I get really close with this group of Marines. They had just come back from a deployment. They... Also, California Marines have long hair. East Coast Marines, like I was, are shaved. So I show up with my hair shaved, and I stick out like a sore thumb. Well, they then call me the boot, and they made me do everything, you know, the hazing that you expect in the Marine Corps. Well, we do a buildup, and we are sent to the Syrian border. So this is the end of 2003 and 2004. And our only job was to make sure arms weren't coming across uh, the Syrian border. And we patrol this tiny town of Huseba on foot. And it was, it was an area neglected by Saddam. There wasn't a lot. It was mostly desert. You could see the beautiful Euphrates. Um, and then just sand. These just look like 100-year-old houses. And we came storming in. I remember it was to show force. That was what they wanted, to show force. And on day one, 
an IED went off, an improvised explosive device. We had been there for 30 minutes, and all you would do is be on a foot patrol, and they would see you and trigger it with a cell phone, and then a blast would go off. Well, the first one went off, and it just threw a Marine into the air. And I remember us all being really excited because the Marine survived, and their previous deployment, they didn't even wear flak jackets. So it was this feeling of, wow, that's probably the most exciting thing that will ever happen in our careers. Um, I was not prepared for what was to come, though. And so how long were you stationed there before you actually experienced injury? So I was there for four and a half months. Every single day were IEDs and... Um, mortars coming in. It was a really, it felt like the Wild West. Um, we had a hundred of us there, so it was with Force Recon, Sniper Attachment, 3-7 Lima, and of the hundred of us, 26 were killed, mostly by IEDs. Um, and on April 8th, I'm on a foot patrol, and um, I had rear security, and I'm turning around, and then doof, I black out. And when I come to, I can see that my legs are blown open. I have shrapnel through my arms, through my eye, through my hand. Um, I can hear PFC Vega screaming. And I see Chris Wasser, my best friend, on the ground next to me, um, who took most of the IED to the head. Yeah. He did not survive? So Chris did not survive. And here I am at the second lowest point in my life after losing my mom. And the corpsman comes running up and the corpsman shoots me up with morphine. And I went from a feeling of drowning. Um, I knew that I was going to die. I was aware of you know, how fragile life is and this is it. And then the corpsman shoots me up with morphine and I had a sense of peace and tranquility and I was okay. Um, I was airlifted immediately. They took me to Germany. Then I was taken to Walter Reed where I had 32 surgeries and I was told I'd never walk again. Yeah, I was uh, surprised by how long you were actually at Walter Reed and how long you were receiving health care. Share with everybody how long it was. Yeah, a year and a half, which is a long time, and it was partially due to infections. So they would do a surgery, then I would have an infection, and infection is really dangerous at a hospital. That's the last thing you want. So um, they had to do one surgery at a time and they would stabilize everything else. Um, I remember they soldered my leg, basically. It was, I couldn't move it. I had all these bars sticking through me, holding bones in place. And um, slowly, one at a time, they did surgeries and they pieced me back together, which is what they do really well. Um, Walter Reed, which is now at Bethesda Naval, is the best hospital in the world. And I was looking at veterans with missing limbs, missing every limb. Um, veterans from IED explosions that may have lost their arm. Their arm would be stitched into their stomach um, because it's the best place to heal and get fresh blood. Just amazing things were happening there. Um, and they had said you would never walk again. Uh, what do you suppose... Uh, what, what caused you not to absorb that into your brain and walk again anyway? Uh, maybe just the uh, determination that the Marines gave me. I don't know. If a doctor says you can't do something and you really want to, and you're a Marine, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I just kept, uh, kept on. And they, it was strange. They gave me the option. They said, we can try this surgery we've never done before on your right knee. Um, and if it doesn't work, we're going to have to amputate above knee. But if it does work, you'll have about 45 degrees range of motion. Do you want to try it? And I said, what's the alternative? And they said, amputation. So I said, yeah, let's try it. And here I am. So I do have, um, proud to have my own legs, bionic at that. And yeah, slow and steady, day after day, was able to take another step further. And um, yeah, so physically I was healing, which is amazing and even a year and a half um, I left there and I I was on my own two feet um, but what I didn't anticipate was kind of the psychological suffering that um, took years to identify and then address 
So had you uh, struggled with addiction while you were uh, serving before you were injured? Definitely. So in high school, I was drinking a lot. And I thought, you know what, the Marines are going to square that away. I'm not going to be drinking in the Marine Corps. Well, it's just socially sanctioned in the Marines. So it was exacerbated by uh, my time, especially as a grunt, um, just really some wild individuals that I was <laughs> amongst. So I think it got worse. And then I deployed and was sober the entire deployment because you're not allowed to have any alcohol uh, overseas. But then the morphine being introduced to my body and then being at Walter Reed, I had a mainline injection into my veins, morphine, oxy dilated, fentanyl, really the strongest opioids that we have on this planet, I was receiving at the highest legal dose possible. And I can see now that I was doing that for my emotional pain, that the physical pain um, I could handle. But I just could not, same as losing my mother at a young age, I could not handle the thought of being separated from my tribe, being separated from my purpose, and uh, losing my identity. I know that you've said that you left the hospital with a bag of pills, but no hope. Yeah, and that's, that's true. I had um, a giant bag of oxy and fentanyl, fentanyl lollipops, but I had no plan. And that is a dangerous recipe. And I'm seeing this repeated with the veterans that I now work with and try to support. Um, and they really said, good luck. And for about seven years, I struggled. And I would draw lines in the sand and say, you know what, I do not, I do not want to make my life any worse. Um, but I will, if I run out early, I'm going to go to the street, but I'm only going to purchase designer oxys. But then, you know, the street isn't a pharmacy, so you find yourself introduced to other substances like heroin. And it doesn't matter how much I loved my family, it doesn't matter how much I wanted to be a better person, as much as I wanted this change, I could not make the change. I was not in a position to make it, and steadily I lost everything that I loved uh, because of this disease of addiction. And so you ultimately ended up homeless. Yes, so I was homeless, uh, couch surfing, and um, yeah, I was, the best way to describe it is that I wanted to die, but I didn't have the courage to kill myself, and so that's, it was really the slow suicide, um, and I was drinking 32 beers a day, and just hoping I didn't wake up. What was the rock bottom that made you decide to go a different direction. So it was the anniversary that happened every year and I would have to reach out to Chris Wasser who was killed. I would reach out to his mom and she was very sweet and she always asks how I'm doing and how is life and I would always make up some lie that life has never been better, just wanting to make Chris proud. And for whatever reason, it just dawned on me that I'm not living the life that I deserve to live Chris Wasser was killed, he was married, he was squared away, and here I am, still alive, and I have nothing uh, to show for his life. So I went to the VA hospital uh, with a little help from my brother and uh, did the inpatient there, and yeah, journey of a thousand steps began. So uh, obviously you end up, end up clean and sober. What are some of the tools that, that helped you uh, maintain that sobriety and end up back in school? So this is kind of the work that I do every day. What are the tools to sobriety? What helps a person change their life? And what's interesting, I had tried before that. I had tried before I woke up April 8th and said, I need to do this. In fact, I tried to um, achieve recovery probably eight times before that. And I failed over and over and over again. And it wasn't until I said, my best efforts are what got me here, and my best efforts are not going to get me out of this. And I threw my hands up, I said, I'm powerless, and um, luckily there are amazing programs 
I happened to turn to a 12-step program in the very beginning and said, I'm powerless over this. Um, also coupled with medication. So this was something that I, I had a stigma against, but I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. If I smelled certain things, I would go straight back to being blown up. If I heard certain sounds, immediately my body would go to the fight or flight. I also had depression. But in my family, we never talked about depression, never talked about any of these things. So it was a willingness to say that I am suffering and a willingness to listen to other people, especially those uh, like doctors and therapists, and allow them to guide me through this because I was trying to steer the ship for too long. So, so for people out there who have loved ones who they see struggling in a similar way, what advice do you give them? Well, the, I think I had family members all around me saying, what is he doing? And approaching me saying, do this, do this, do this, do this. It was the unconditional support of my brother, Matthew, that really helped me achieve my goals. Because instead of telling me what to do, he asked me, what do you want to do? What, what kind of life do you want to live, Kevin? And what are the barriers to you achieving that? And I'm telling him, well, the biggest barrier is that I have to spend 23 hours a day finding my next fix. I have to spend all of my money on this addiction and it's in the way of me wanting, I want to work with people. I want to support people and promote healing and love, but my addiction stopping me. And then we sat down and said, hey, how can we help you to get better? Have you ever thought about how much money you spent on your addiction through the years? Oh, yeah. Yes. It's a lot. It's a lot. In fact, I was of uh, the Bush era. If you were hospitalized for more than three months, they gave you a check for $150,000, no questions asked. So here I am, 19, 20 years old, addicted to opioids, and I'm not really online up here. Let's say my brain's not working. So when I was discharged, my bank account, because I was still making combat pay for the last year and a half, plus $150,000, and went through all of that in a year. Wow. And that's being... That is addiction at its finest. It doesn't matter. Everything else is f second to that. And so, uh, fast forward, uh, tell us a little bit about the successes that you achieved once you got clean and sober and started applying the new things you had learned. So I was really fortunate. I used the GI Bill, Voc Rehab, and um, did my bachelor's and then a master's in social work. That was where I learned everything that basically social workers had helped me with. I was like, oh, I recognize all this. This is what was happening to me when I was in the hospital. Now I get to turn around and support someone else. Uh, but I had to do an internship. And I was interested maybe in the VA hospital, but I didn't know because I had been going there. I don't know if I want to work where I also go. So I learned about this place called Veterans Treatment Court. And it's a court program supporting veterans, keeping them out of prison, but it's accountability and treatment. So the idea is veterans like myself, the reason certain behaviors, especially um, justice involved behaviors happen are because we don't have the appropriate coping skills and we have unaddressed suffering. Um, so instead of just sending a veteran away to prison where they'll sit for 10 years, nothing changes, and research shows they're gonna get out and return to the justice system, how about we change that, provide some treatment? So I got to intern with Veterans Treatment Court, and then I graduated, applied for the job, and got it in 2017. Uh, and I've been doing Veterans Treatment Court ever since. So recidivism is this big, uh, tracking metric. It's the likelihood someone's going to leave prison and return, recidivate. 83% uh, of people when they leave the justice system are going to return back to prison. But the Veterans Treatment Court model, it's evidence-based, 10% will return. Um, and that is an astounding statistic because we are taking the most high-risk, high-need individuals. These are the individuals that have 
a life of justice involvement. It's not like a, your first offense. This is your 20th offense, and that is the life that they're living. So it's amazing to see veterans every day who show up who are homeless, who show up who have an addiction, who feel helpless, have no purpose, have no hope, and by the end of our two-year journey with them, they have stable housing, they're reconnected with their kids or their wife, um, really the experience that I've had. Um, and I get to do that every single day. Is there anything in particular that you notice amongst those that succeed through the program? Is there, are there any attributes that they seem to have consistently? Yes, so the attribute of community and connection is really important. Anyone that tries to go on this journey alone is not going to be successful. That's what it is. And the veterans that are willing to be vulnerable and share openly, I see them uh, doing the best time and time again. If a veteran can be vulnerable, they're going to be successful. If um, you know, they're also engaged in treatment and all the other 400 things we expect. But, um, which is hard because in the Marine Corps, we're taught to be stoic, we're taught to be strong, we're taught to be invincible. And so it is a paradigm shift to then say, hey, I'm actually not doing okay. Can I talk to you about that? Are there any uh, success stories in particular that pop into your head of those uh, men and women that you've been working with? Yeah. Um, the, the stories aren't unlike mine and they I think are just the, the story of redemption. We have so many young OIF and OEF veterans that are coming back that have done multiple deployments. So our generation has, on average, half of them have done three deployments minimum. Um, I was blown up on my first deployment. So I consider myself really lucky. Um, but we have a veteran who came into our court in 2017 and then absconded. He just left and we didn't see him. He then got arrested again. And our judge, Judge Pope said, you know what, our motto on our coin, on our flags is leave no veteran behind. We want to try again. And I remember, you know, it was like, oh, I don't know if we should. Last time he left immediately and left the state. So we did and um, I have seen him go from, so he had two kids he hadn't talked to in 12 years, has um, family members that have disowned him because he has taken advantage of them over and over. And this is just what we do. It's all about survival. Um, and over the two year journey, he has um, gotten a college degree. He is becoming a peer support counselor. He is reconnected with his kids. Um, and it's, I just see this again and again, and these are the priceless things. We, I do have one story. It was a Marine Corps veteran. He was uh, Vietnam, and he had lived since the Vietnam War in Florida, as he says, just drinking himself to death. And he also had kids and family, but they didn't even know he was alive. He was somehow cross country, passing through Asheville, gets a charge. He has this record, enters our program. He ends up um, achieving sobriety and he does really well. And then he graduates and uh, for two years he maintained his sobriety. But his 50 years of hard living caught up and he died. Um, and. I went to the funeral, and I went to the funeral with everyone from Veterans Court, and there were uh, the VTC staff and then three people. And it was sad that that was his life. Three people had shown up, but those three people said, we just want to say thank you because for the last four years and this final two years of his life, we feel like we got our brother back, and she said we feel like um, this is the happiest he's ever been. So he passed away, but he had sobriety. And so that's the gift of just authenticity in life. It's amazing. That's great. Well, let's let's uh, change gears just a little bit. Um, you also have another passion in your life, which is music. 
Yep. T talk to us about your music career. <laughs> well, I think uh, I'm an aspiring musician. I have toured Europe. I've played with uh, hundreds of bands. But you know, one thing I learned touring the U.S. and touring across the globe is there are millions of bands and millions of really talented bands out there. Um, so yeah, I'm not in, not in this for the radio hits. And you're a drummer, right? I'm a drummer. Yeah. yeah so really, my the bandmates would argue I'm not even a musician. I'm a drummer. Whatever <laughs> for whatever that's worth. <laughs> and where are you based out of now? Casey based out of Asheville. Okay. Yep. And uh, playing in five bands right now. And I, although since COVID, most of the recording has happened in the basement. So I will record something and then send it through the computer, through the internet, to someone in California, or I'll record for someone in Richmond, Virginia. So I have done more drumming during the last two years than I have probably in the last 10. And tell us the name of the organization you work for again. Uh, the Veterans Treatment Court. And if somebody wants to keep up with you or what's going on with them, what's the best way to do that? You can Google Asheville Veterans Treatment Court. Our, our website is bunkumveteranscourt.com. That's B-U-N-C-O-M-B-E, veteranscourt.com. Excellent. Do you have, uh, have music-related social media? Are you, are you putting out videos and stuff? Not yet, but um, when I do, I'll let you know. Okay, let me know, and we'll, and we'll put it out there. Thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us uh, here at Discovery Park and on the, for the recording of Real Foot Forward. Uh, we'll put this up on the podcast, and everybody around the country will be able uh, to hear it. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.